Welcome to our episode today with my friend and colleague, Nidia Tejarina Darby. And Nidia is from San Antonio, Texas, and has just written a wonderful book that's going to come out in November called Therapeutic Yoga Works. And the thing I love about this book is that it's about common people who have common problems, such as severe, severe back pain. I don't know if you know this, but in 2020, this is from the World Health Organization, in 2020, about 619 million people globally were experiencing lower back pain. And they estimate that that is going to increase to 843 million cases by 2050. And this is because we're aging, we're sitting too long at our computers on Zoom meetings. Low back pain is the single leading cause of disability worldwide. And it can really hit you at any age. I'm going to tell you a little story about myself. While the prevalence of getting a low back pain episode increases as you age, there's many, many people that it's happening younger and younger. And for a lot of us, it's what we call nonspecific low back pain, meaning we don't even know why it's happening. And that's about 90% of the cases. So Nydia's book is addressing spinal issues, but a lot of the stories she tells in her new book are about low back pain. Now, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm just going to say it because I think we need to be real and authentic. I have had very severe low back pain. I think it started in college. I was a heptathlete at the University of Northern Iowa, which means that I competed at a division one level in high jump, long jump, shot put, hurdles, 800 meters, 200 meters, and throwing the javelin. And we would work out about six hours a day. I mean, this was 30 plus years ago, but I ruined my back doing athletics. I know there's so many great things about participating in athletics, but it really ruined my back and somewhat my knees, even to this day. So when I get under tremendous amounts of stress, when I sit too long, when I'm not hydrating enough, when I'm not feeling embodied and not taking care of my body the way that I need to, I have a low back episode. And I just had one a couple of weeks ago leading into a nine-day module. Usually I get a little stressed out before these nine-day modules. And once again, I found myself laying on my back in my bed, having my husband assist me with the smallest things because I really couldn't and didn't want to try to walk. And so I pretty much laid in bed for two days and it went away and I I got better. You know, that two day period used to sometimes be four days or five days. So I'm really making progress and it used to happen a couple of times a year, but now it only happens about once a year. So I feel like I'm making progress, but it's always this really big reminder that if I don't take care of myself mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, my back pain is going to crop up and it's kind of the signal to me that, hey, you're not paying attention. You're not taking care of yourself. So what that last episode did for me is it got me hydrating again. You can see it on, if you're on YouTube, I get my little hydration cups with me. Started running again every morning, get out of bed and go for a run, lifting weights, not sitting so long. It was a real wake up call because I had been feeling so good for so long that I thought, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. This isn't going to happen anymore. And came back and got me just like that. So I think you're going to love this interview, especially those of you who have had low back pain or you know someone that has low back pain. This is going to be a great episode for you to reflect on the causes of low back pain, what we can do about it, and how therapeutic yoga and yoga therapy can help support us in our lifestyle when we have a tendency towards low back pain. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour and Beyond. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Our episode today is meant to inspire you and empower you. We are so appreciative that you've helped the Yoga Therapy Hour have 100,000 downloads. Season six is going to be the best one yet, and we are so grateful to you, our listeners. Let's go to the show. Welcome, my friend and colleague, Nidia Tiharina Darby. So nice to have you here today. 
I am so happy to be here, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. Nydia, where are you located? I always like our listeners to kind of get a picture in their mind of where you are. I am in San Antonio, Texas. Mm. When I go to your website, which is called openhandinstitute.com, there are all these beautiful pictures of you in San Antonio. And I think, is that her home? Did she go downtown? Like, where are those beautiful pictures on your website from? It is my home. Oh. Uh, This is where I now have my studio and I looked for a property that I could put my studio on when I downsized from a large commercial location. I wanted to practice what I preach. And your students are lucky to get to come there. It looks like a retreat center or something. (laughs) I wanted them to have, you know, when you come to practice, I wanted them to get out of their cars and listen and hear the birds and see my cats and hear the chickens. And I really did want that. And you set an intention and it came to fruition. So I'm so grateful. Well, speaking of retreat centers, I think you and I, like I knew of you and I had said hello to you, but I really got to know you and love you at Kripalo one year. Yes, at, at Sear. Oh my gosh. That's and my heart. Heart. I completely fell in love with you. It was like you, you and Terry and I were just three peas in a pod. And I haven't laughed that hard very often with yoga people. I thought these are my kind of women. They don't take themselves too seriously. <laughs> we had such a good time. And I was just honored and thrilled to meet you too. I was like, hey. I had a big, huge girl crush. I was just like, oh, well, I did too. After that weekend, I was like, I love them. <laughs> All right. Well, Nydia, you have written a new book that we're going to talk about today. But before we, you know, spill the beans on the title and the release date and all of that, I just first want to start with where it all began with a woman named Carolyn, whose back would go into full spasms and the pain was so intense, it would leave her unable to function fully for days or weeks at a time. I want to talk about Carolyn because I've been there. Carolyn could be me. So tell us about Carolyn and your relationship with her and how you supported her. Well, Carolyn was minding her own business when she was able to go on a trip. She hadn't been out of her home the year previous. She had had, when her back would go out, it would go out and be in full spasm intermittently for three months. And she would be incapacitated, barely getting to the bathroom, you know, just to having to take meds. And the year before we met each other, her back went out three times. And so that means that for nine months, the year before we met, she was not functioning. She was already in her mid sixties and she had things to do. She had grandbabies and a potential wedding coming up. And so she met one of my clients on a trip and my client said, you need to call Nydia. She didn't know exactly what was going to happen when she met this physical therapist who uses yoga. You know, what is that? And that was in the nineties. So it was a little bit odd, (laughs) you know how that goes, but she made the call and we spoke and we set some sessions. And this was before I had an actual physical location. I was going to my client's homes and we started a professional relationship. We would work with each other once a week. It so happens that we took about 12 weeks, you know, almost the same amount of time that her back would go into full spasm. And at that time, you know, I function as a physical therapist and a therapeutic yoga specialist. And so back in those days, we didn't have direct access as a physical therapist. I still did private work. When I did my, what I call a therapeutic yoga assessment, I'm assessing and making a determination if this individual needs physical therapy or if they can do the therapeutic yoga with me, if there's an active medical condition, meaning if had she been in full spasm or there was things happening, then I wouldn't be able to work with her as a therapeutic yoga specialist. I would then put on my other hat. But at that time, she didn't have any spasm. She was in between. And so it was a perfect opportunity. But I will say that when I'm doing those assessments, I am mindful of those limitations and I have to wear a different hat. Ultimately, my client's well-being and health is my first concern. And so I won't do anything to the best of my ability, do anything to put them in harm's way. 
So there may be people listening right now that really don't understand the scope of practice of a physical therapist versus a yoga therapist and where that line is. I know you said if she had been in full spasm, but what is the difference? What do you do as a PT versus what do you do as a YT? (laughs) So interestingly enough, especially now, they're very similar. Mm. Uh, except for the fact that as a physical therapist, there are modalities that I have access and I can actually use. I don't personally, professionally use a lot of the different modalities. Like I don't have ultrasound here. I tend not to use that, but I am a certified dry needling specialist. So I can actually use acupuncture needles to help to do dry needling. And that is an option that I have when someone's in pain. In the physical therapy world, we call it therapeutic exercise. When it comes to the activities, they're really similar. In fact, they're the same, but that little fine line in between my communication with the doctors, making certain that they know and we're communicating in Texas, we have direct access so I can actually evaluate and treat without a prescription. I work on fee for service, so the client is paying me directly and I don't use private insurance, but some of my clients, I tell them, call your insurance company and if they're willing, they will reimburse you. And that happens many times. And I also don't see somebody, sometimes clinically in the traditional clinic, they might see you three times a week or something like that. I tend to see somebody once a week depending on the situation, we're developing their program in physical therapy world, as well as in our therapeutic yoga too, you know, so they're similar, but when it comes to them having an active condition, maybe they're a breast cancer survivor and they just going through chemo and they need my specialized attention, looking at some things as a doctor of physical therapy, We are trained in understanding the pharmaceutical part. We don't prescribe anything that way, but we have to understand some of these things. And so it is a little muddled, but over the years that I've been doing this work, the line gets very distinct. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's what does my patient, physical therapy, client, therapeutic yoga, what's the best thing for them? And then I will act accordingly. I don't know if that helps, but it's no, it helps. It's lovely. And I think so many people have this question. I think that leads us to one more question before we get back to Carolyn to hear what happened to her after 12 weeks is what are the areas that yoga therapy can support the person that maybe PT doesn't? Great question. There's so much that's being done with the yoga therapy. The awareness practice, Mm. the breath work that we do, the groundedness that we help a person begin to move forward with, the embodiment Mm. that we help people with. I believe physical therapy is needing that, you know, occupational therapists, their curriculum is different. And they do more of that work. They have more of the psych background. You know, we we get several courses in psych, but they've got a little bit more going on. In fact, whenever I talk to an occupational therapist, I say, you should consider, you know, yoga therapy. I think that you'll really appreciate it because they just kind of, I'm going to say this directly, no offense to my PT peers out there, but many of us, and I'm going to put myself first here, are type A and we're just... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you don't always see the whole person. I mean, I'll be the first one to say that I'm in recovery as a type A personality and it's taken me years and I'm still working on it. But for whatever reason, it seems to me in the past that physical therapy majors were very, very driven and very type A and let's just get this going. And sometimes to be quite frank, missing an opportunity to see a whole person now. Mm. My people are going to get mad at me next week. I go and I present at the Texas Physical Therapy Association, but all of my friends are going to come and they do love to do therapeutic yoga with me. So, (laughs) And I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of PTs that are learning a lot of these skills too. And I even have PTs that I know that 
are taking a full yoga therapy certification program for continuing ed and personal growth and development. So I don't think we have to choose either, or I think they're complementary. And I agree. I have been over the past five years presenting at the Texas at our annual conference, because I want more physical therapists to recognize the first thing I want is for them to embody the practice for themselves so that Mm -hmm. they can actually feel and recognize the benefit And I find that when we do that, then they are more able to implement breath work, recognize, you know, what they're doing, offering therapeutic exercise that, hey, is your patient breathing while they're doing this? Are they focusing their attention? And so far, so good. We've got a really neat, you know, group and we call ourselves integrative physical therapists, right? Because we're integrating other modalities and other ways. And it's such a great thing. I'm really encouraged for us as a profession that way. So let's go back to Carolyn, this woman who sometimes would be down three months straight. You said you worked with her for 12 weeks, not long, but what happened? Well, we started with our first session. You know, the first part is a phone call. It's hi. Okay. And in that phone call where I'm trying to determine whether I have something to offer. Once our conversation, she told me her history is like, yeah, we've got something. I've got something for you. And then we start with our first session and the first session, I call it a therapeutic yoga assessment. And that therapeutic yoga assessment is the time, you know, these days it's a little different because when I first saw her, that was a long time ago. And in the book, I write about it. You know, I actually had physical pieces of paper that I gave her. These days I send a digital intake questionnaire, but we review her old history. And in that old history is really important because that is helping me to make a determination. If there is something in her history, you know, if she has a cardiac history, then I'm going to check blood pressure again to determine if she needs a more medical approach versus a therapeutic yoga. Then I have her move. We were moving and I use the therapeutic sun salutation as an assessment tool. It begins the process of standing mountain. I'm looking at how well she's within her own body. And then that therapeutic sun salutation gently mobilizes every major joint and it gets the person that got her down onto the floor. I'm evaluating, assessing that if this individual is not able to get on the floor or has, you know, limitations, I can see that in the sun salutation. And so we did that and she was, you know, my gosh, that's harder than I didn't realize. One, she didn't think she could do it. Two, she did it and she was surprised. And then during that time when she was doing it, I reminded her that she was holding her breath. Oh, and she didn't really realize it. And I said, we're going to use the breath to help us determine intensity, how hard you're working. If you're going, then you're working too hard. We're going to use the breath to determine how long you're in a position or posture, three breaths, five breaths, 10 breaths at max. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to use the breath. Most importantly, the calm, smooth, soft, gentle breath to help downregulate the nervous system. That whole process of having her body even with movements that were either unfamiliar or somewhat uncomfortable, you know, as she was breathing, that's helping her nervous system calm down and recognize, hey, this is uncomfortable, but I'm okay. Everything's all right. So let's turn the coin over then. I'm sure there's a lot of yoga teachers out there thinking, well, I could do that. I could give someone a sun salutation and help them with their breath and down regulate their autonomic nervous system. Yes. And I hope that they will. That's why I'm trying to share this therapeutic sun salutation with as many people as possible. <laughs> it's in the book. As our free gift, every week we give a free gift and this will be in the show notes. Nydia has generously offered to share videos of parts of the therapeutic sun salutation, but then the whole practice of it. So we'll put that in the show notes as our free gift. So that'll be great. So you have done an assessment all through talking to her as well as watching her move. Then what, what did you do with her next? To think that you helped this woman who has been suffering for so long is incredible. Well, you know, from there, part of that assessment continues. That first session is a long one and we take as long as we need. Technically, whatever my fee is, the fee is the same, but we need, I ask for as as much time as we can, because I want that first session to be successful. By the time that we're done, she's going to have homework. So the next thing that is happening after that is assessing her breathing. 
and start doing some instruction and noticing, is she doing diaphragmatic breathing? Is there a lot of tension in her body? Is she holding tension in certain places and guiding her? Then I use therapeutic bridge posture. I call it the therapeutic bridge posture because it's a little bit different. It's not just on your back, lifting your hips, but it's an integration of, I need you to breathe. I need you to be aware of your shoulders back and down. I need you to anchor the hands into the mat, thumbs, fingers wide. I need you to focus your attention on the quality of your breath, begin to engage your glutes. And so that particular movement practice is helping to create a form of breath-centered movement awareness, almost meditative practice, Mm. keeping that individual. So I am actually dropping in a little meditation to begin with. Mm -hmm. In our conversations, oftentimes I talk about that. And and in the book, you'll, (laughs) if you read the book, you'll hear a conversation that Caroline and I had about meditation. And she was a little bit concerned. Remember, we're in Texas, a conservative state. And she had a question about that. And, and we answered <laughs> We'll have to read the book to see what happened. But I think that is a big question for a lot of people. I was speaking to a potential yoga student for our Optimal State Yoga Therapy School the other day, and she's a teacher in Texas. And she said, I really want to take yoga therapy training, but I'm not going to be able to call this yoga or yoga therapy. You know, and that's just the state that we're in. And I just told her, of course, we don't want to do cultural appropriation, But I also don't want to cut off hundreds of elementary school kids from something that could change their lives. Completely. Yeah. Goodness. Mm. It is a process. And we did. We had that conversation. And so read the book. You'll find out what happened. It's pretty cool. All right. So you're, you're teaching her how to do the postures, how to breathe, how to meditate in air quotes. (laughs) Focus attention. Twelve weeks. Like what happened to her? So after our first session, she's got homework and she's to do the homework. And that first session is going to mean a lot because what I tell them at the very end is, hey, I'm coming back in a week. So in order for you to get the best value for what we're doing, you have to do the homework. If you don't do the homework, you might not want to continue. One, I'm coming back and we're going to look at how you did and we may either make some changes or add to your program. So let's not waste your resources, our time. Let's make sure. And so I give that, I'm pretty stern about that because life is short and we need to take this seriously. And so she did the work. I came back the following week and she had great questions. So that told me she did the work. Then she demonstrated when I was guiding her and I could see that her body was more used to. So again, it confirmed that she had done the work and she was ready for more. And I just began to give her a couple of more activities. Gradually every week we are spending time together, answering questions. I'm reviewing what she did as her homework. She's showing me, she's asking me questions. And then I'm either adding or subtracting an activity and or eventually in one of the sessions, it was time to talk about building muscular endurance through the form of walking for exercise. And we talked about that. Then she had a beautiful community that she could walk outdoors and she was in a very nice fitness room she had in her home and there was a treadmill in there. And I said, if it's rainy or, you know, inclement weather, then you can use the treadmill. And she goes, you know, I've never used that before. I've had it. My husband used to use it. And, and I thought part of that session then was determining if she's safe to use that treadmill teaching her how to use that treadmill, making certain that she understands how to be safe and that it's an appropriate thing to recommend. So we did that on one session and now she had some options and she's starting to use her fitness room that she had in her home much more than her husband. (laughs) It was pretty neat. So by the end of the three months, was she, I mean, I know with back pain, at least for me, I'll be fine for a year. And then one day it will strike and I will be on my back for two days. Like, do you think this is something that her episodes became less intense and less frequent, but they still are there and she has to work with it? Do you think they disappeared completely? Like, what do you think happened to Carolyn? So part of the process, the evaluation, the assessment process is ongoing because 
that's the nature of our work when we're working with someone either as a physical therapist or in the yoga therapy, the therapy of yoga. And so every session I'm evaluating and I'm having suspicions, what is the source of her problem? Why was her back going out? And Truly, that is what I'm really doing. I'm looking for the source because she presented with an MRI and some x-rays that showed bulging discs. And in the process, I'm looking at that and I'm assessing her to see if she's having any of those symptoms and she's not presenting. And then I'm educating. One of the biggest challenges that I find with those of us who experience pain is the unknown and the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And then she had this MRI that said, there is a bulge in there. And back in the nineties, when I was an early clinician, early in those days, we had just gotten MRI technology that was readily available for many. And now everyone's getting an MRI and everyone's got bulging discs. And back in the nineties, it was, oh, disc bulging, that's the source of your pain. Let's do surgery, correct that problem. Well, there was a lot of surgeries going on that here comes a Nydia strong opinion that were unnecessary. In fact, too much. And we're not correcting the source of the problem because as you know, and many of you know, that are out there might understand pain is a very multifaceted thing. And so in Carolyn's situation, she was fearful. Mm -hmm. She was overwhelmed. She was stressed. And there was a combination of things that were happening. And then she had a history. You know, I don't know if I referred to it in the book, but she had a family member who had major problems and already knew that, oh, that must be me. I guess I now am that person and I'm going to be incapacitated and I'm going to lose my ability to have a wonderful, joyful life without pain. So there's so many facets that come in. And part of my work was to help educate, inform, so that she could understand. And in the writings, I share a lot about, you know, I bring a little bit of the science in and I talk about what the different Cleveland Clinic and, you know, all of the different major health networks that are providing, they're doing the research and sharing it with us helping her to recognize that just because there's a bulge in your spine doesn't mean one, that is the source of your problem Two, that it's going to incapacitate you three, you know, that it can't be changed. And so giving her that information, empowering her to understand that her body's amazing and it has an unlimited potential for healing. And that what I'm recommending is that we give it that opportunity, help her begin to trust Again, that's, there's a lot of layers to that. And if a person is ready for that, you know, you asked, does she finally get to a place where she doesn't, you know, hurt anymore? She gained skills in awareness, in paying attention, in improving her muscular endurance, improving her posture, but also recognizing when she was doing things that she probably wasn't a good idea, like not asking for help when she's moving the heavy potted plant, you know, <laughs> and so making choices, making changes as she needs. Okay. This is such a joke because in our training programs, many of us have had severe back pain, but for some reason, we still want to move the furniture by ourselves. My partner isn't here. So I'll just move this furniture it's that reprogramming that you can ask for help. You can be patient until somebody's there to help you. You don't have to do it all on. That's part of the whole person kind of integrative medicine approach. Amy, I'm still struggling with asking for help. I'm now 50. How old am I? 57. And, you know, when I was in my 20s, heck no, I can do this on my own. I don't need any help. Wonder Woman was my person that I wanted to be. And, I'm still working on it. I'm getting better. And that's part of my process. You know, I am an eight limbed yoga lifestyle practitioner subscribing mm -hmm. to the eight limbs. And so it's very humbling to see yourself in that space, in that place where it's like, ah, uh, you know, but it's important. I did it again. Oops. Yeah. I did yeah. it again. Yeah. Uh, well, I need to go back to something you said, because this is so critical. You said in the nineties, MRIs had just come out. We all thought that if there's a disc bulging on the MRI, that means 
there's pain. It will always be there unless you get surgery and get it fixed. And that kind of structural manifestation is the end of the story. And now in 2023, we understand that there are people who have MRIs that show a lot of bulging discs that have zero pain. And there are people with, you know, no bulging discs or very small bulging discs that have incapacitating pain. So can you just talk us through what we've learned since 1990 to 2023 about pain and why what we're seeing on that structural MRI is not the end of the story or, you know, there's so much more to it than that. Completely. And when it comes to the science of pain, many of our peers are much, much, much more well-informed than I am, you know, Shelly Prosco and Neil Pearson. I mean, those guys are doing amazing work, but what I have seen over is, you know, this nervous system, the brain is our command center. And then the central nervous system goes down through that nervous system. You know, there's a lot going on with this nervous system that there begins to be a disconnect almost when pain begins. And maybe there was an insult, an injury, inflammation, but there are for many different reasons, not just physical, many of them are more social, emotional, and related to, for many of us, forms of trauma that mm-hmm. keep us in that place. And once again, I'm not a trauma specialist. I don't call myself trauma informed in any way, but When it shows itself in my work with a client, then I make certain that I have a network and I do, I have a network of psychologists and counselors to help my client get the support that they need because that begins to unravel the source also, you know, sometimes it's physical and we see it and okay, we, we treat that and everything gets better. But for the most part, you know, pain is such a large umbrella and the nervous system being at the foundation of it. In the book, I talk about how I have a conversation with Caroline that says, you know, many people have told you or told her, and some people can identify with this, where you begin to think when you're living with pain that your medical practitioners think that it's all in your head. Mm. And I do have conversations with my clients where I say something that's kind of controversial for them. And I say, I kind of agree that it could all be in your head. And they look at me like, excuse me. And I'll say that brain is in your skull. Yeah. And that nervous system is controlling and coordinating a whole lot. So let's change that idea of them not believing you when you think that, but yes, maybe this is all in your head starting off because your brain is starting and or communicating to kind of also, and I do that if I know that I can, to also bring some levity. It's like, it's okay. That thought is not a bad thought. That's just someone's opinion. And maybe it is in your brain. Maybe it is in your nervous system. And there are things that can be done because a nervous system is so plastic, so pliable and changeable. And these days we're learning more and more just how much it is. And so it's so great. I was going to say that, you know, when people find out that they actually can downregulate their nervous system and that causes the pain cycle to be interrupted and that we can do that using our breath It almost to them, like to me, that's common sense. Now we've been doing it for 25 years. I've seen the results. I've known it in my own body. I've seen it in my clients. But when you say that to the common person who doesn't do yoga, isn't into breathing or meditation, you tell them your breath regulation is going to impact your nervous system, which is going to stop the chronic pain firing of your nervous system. It almost seems too good to be true. Do you have that with your clients? Yeah, I do. They look at me like I've lost my mind (laughs) and they're thinking, you know, is this a good idea? And I'll ask them, I need you to do the work. Go do this breath practice. Go try it. When you wake up in the middle of the night, start, focus your attention on your breath. Let yourself get up if you have to, but go and then do your breathing practice. And these days, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful because people come back and they tell me, oh my, you were, this works, this works. And sometimes they'll come back and say, it didn't take it completely away, but I now, I was able to X, Y, Z, do this. Roll over in bed without feeling like I was going to, you know, yeah, 
Thanks. That's just been the beautiful thing. You know, I wear the t-shirt. The only thing that you have to do is breathe. That's one of my mantras and part for the practice. Because ultimately, really, if we don't breathe, that's a big problem. So we're wired for breath. It is spirit. It is everything. It's exciting. It's so basic that we just think, no, it couldn't be that. (laughs) Well, and I think we actually need to acknowledge how much training it takes a therapeutic yoga teacher or yoga therapist to skillfully downregulate the nervous system to reduce the pain. I was talking to a golfer that I work with the other day about this type of thing. And he said to me, well, I take deep breaths already. I said, show me what you do. And he did a big long inhale and he kind of threw his shoulders back and put his chest out and kind of, Oh, I got, I got, took a big breath. And I was like, okay, we need to reformat. We don't want a great big inhalation with your shoulders back and a hold at the top of the inhalation. That's going to actually turn your nervous system on and make it fire more and cause more pain. I said, let's work on the exhalation phase, long, slow, smooth. And he's like, that makes a difference. Like it was strange to him that focusing on the exhalation phase of the breath would give him a completely different effect in his nervous system than the inhalation phase. I experienced that as well. What's the difference? I'm breathing, Nydia. Why would that make any difference? And until they have the experience, it begins to then dawn on them. And the grounding too. Settle. Let your nervous system settle. Give it support. And let yourself be supported. And again, there's many layers to that. No, I don't need any Emotional support, spiritual support. Yeah. Do you use any spiritual teachings in your therapeutic yoga practices? And I use the word spiritual like in a very broad term. When we're doing the practice... If the client is ready for it, I talk about spirit in terms of the breath and my own understanding of what I believe. And as a woman of faith, I move about the planet very grateful that from my perspective, there is a higher power and that grounds me, that connects me. And so I talk about that, that process of the healthiest people I've ever met, things that they have in common, you know, and this was when I was in my twenties, that they have a positive outlook on life. They are physically active daily and they have a belief in a higher power. Mm-hmm. And so that begins to open a door in the conversation. And I typically have that conversation when our first session, and then I can understand what their perception or what their feeling is about that. Some of them agree, yes. And they begin to communicate with me about their own upbringing or where they believe they are spiritually. And then from there, we're able to then move forward. But not a whole lot of spiritual stuff coming from Nydia, other than having them sharing with them that my own personal belief about spirit and breath intertwining And in many different cultures and different backgrounds, the word, the base, the root of spirit, espiritu, and how it is breath, pneumo, breath, spirit. And these words all translate to the same thing. And they come back to breath and they come back to spirit and inspiration, the word, Mm -hmm. respiration, you know, and so that the spirit is everywhere that has allowed me to have some really neat conversations with my clients. And then the door opens and we go wherever that leads us. But no, I don't typically go down and say, well, you've got to go do this. And and when they ask me, Nydia, what is your faith? And I talk about being a woman of faith. You may not find me in a church <laughs> because for me, you know, what am I going to say? Nature is my place where I connect with spirit, but I love and respect, you know, whatever tradition they might be coming from. And then they hear me talk about, you know, and I don't talk about it a lot, but Patanjali and the eight limbs and that process really grounded me. It was almost familiar and frightening at the same time when I was first introduced, like, wait a minute, I get that, you know, the yamas and the niyamas. Yes. My upbringing in the Catholic tradition the Ten Commandments, you know, so it made sense to me and it helped me to more effectively assimilate and subscribe to the eight limbs. So that grounds me and connects me. And then with my clients, I just like to listen and hear what their perspective is. And then I try to answer questions if they have any. For the most part, I always tell them, I'll give you my opinion. I have lots of them, but 
It doesn't mean it's the truth. It's the truth as I know it. <laughs> and I think that's the beauty of yoga is it doesn't require that you even are a spiritual person. You could be, but you don't have to be. You can maintain whatever spiritual or religious beliefs you want and do yoga. They're not in conflict with one another. You could be an agnostic. You could be an atheist. Yoga doesn't say you have to adopt this way. Completely. A yoga person. Yeah, I agree, you know, and I share with my clients if the question arises, I'll tell them my yoga practice actually strengthened my spiritual foundation. <laughs> the light is coming in in a certain way. Well, hello, gee. <laughs> you look, you've got spirit all around you now. For those of you watching on YouTube, it, it really looks beautiful. And it just appeared. Oh, yeah. It's the sun is right in a certain place with the window. So let's see if I need to make change. So you let me know. <laughs> I want to watch you bathe in the sunlight. <laughs> As we speak about spirit. So Nydia, you have this approach for working with people that especially involves spinal pain, whether it's the neck or the low back or, you know, really any part of the spine. And I know you do much more than that, but today we're talking about the spine because of this new book. What would you say is really unique about the way that you approach helping people that have less pain, more mobility, more joy in their lives? I believe it's about empowering the individual, mm -hmm. giving them the tools, making certain, you know, even as a physical therapist, one of my challenges was that people were coming back over and over again because they were depending upon me to fix them. My husband used to laugh at me. He's also a clinician, a physical therapist. And he'd say, Nydia, your business model kind of sucks because you're empowering them and giving them the tools so that they don't need you anymore. And I'm telling him, yes, exactly. Because that to me is the best thing that I could do for someone is to teach them to self-regulate, to teach them what to do in the event of a little increase in intensity of their discomfort to help empower them to have the tools so that they can go off into the sunset, you know, not need me and be independent. Mm -hmm. uh, this is so important to me. And I believe that's my forte. I'm going to teach you how to do this. I need you to do this. You have free will and can choose not to do this. But if your desire is to make a change, there are tools that I'm going to offer you, and then I'm going to want you to use them and select not just from one tool, but select what works. And how do you, I mean, let's talk just for a moment before we close about compliance. How do you get people to comply? Because I think that's a really challenging thing for physical therapists that people come in for their once or twice a week sessions, but they don't actually do those exercises at home. How do you get people to do it? Well, our medical model here in the United States really screwed things up when they started this insurance thing. We've seen the insurance industry where people back in the 90s, again, that was when I started thinking and paying attention to this stuff. But well, you know, in the insurance industry, it was different. There was great coverage. You went, you didn't pay anything. You just went and people treated you and you went as often as you wanted to. And then things started to change. Now there's co-payments and it's getting more expensive. One of the things that I know helps with compliance is that they're paying me out of pocket. They're making a financial transaction. They see it, that money. And I've had individuals who are on a very restricted budget, but they know the value. And so they have paid for something and then they better use it. And so that's one of the aspects that I have found that helps with compliance and the other thing, telling them where I won't see you again, if you don't do this. So if you come back and you haven't done the work, then you're wasting resources and that's not appropriate. I don't want your money. You know, this is not what I'm after. I want to help you improve. I do have to make a living. So that's why I charge, but I want to see you improve. So let's use our resources wisely. And then following up, there's a relationship that also begins. And these clients, you know, we become friendly. We don't go out or anything like that. We don't socialize, but they're family. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to have another connection, which is a family kind of connection. And that is important to me. And I do joke 
seriously with them about the fact that I am somewhat of a mother hen. I do worry. About <laughs> I was just going to say mama Nidia. <laughs> yes, you know, and, and I'll tell them, I'll say, Hey, I do care about what's happening with you. And in the future, if you're going to have a surgery, you know, let me know. I'm a woman who prays so I can put you on my prayer list. I want to be holding you in my heart when you're about to have that process. Nidia, I think what you're talking about is really special that our clients know we care about them. I have clients that I haven't seen for years that I still think about often and I care about and I pray for them. And I kind of feel like as a therapeutic yoga teacher or yoga therapist, we build these really deep, caring relationships with people that last long term. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is that we're working on the community. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I still offer live stream and on-site classes is because the community is important. Many of those clients that I'm seeing one-on-one, I'm trying to get them into community too. I'm trying to say, hey, you're ready now to go to the gentle therapeutic yoga class because community is important. So that first interaction is me reaching out to them and inviting them into community with me. Mm. And hopeful if we can then get them into community in the studio or encouraging them to reach out to their neighbor and sharing, doing a little therapeutic yoga with their neighbor and saying, you know, and, and starting a practice, you know, somehow community though, is just, we understand it, right? We know the research, the science is there. Community is so vital. It is. I mean, loneliness is a big problem. You know, there's so much research to show that loneliness is as bad as smoking. So I agree with you. So Nadia, let's finish up today talking a little bit about your new book called Therapeutic Yoga Works, A Gentle Approach to Eliminating Back Pain and Improving Functional Mobility for Life. I understand we can already download a copy off of Amazon through a Kindle and maybe even get a printable copy. Is that right? We can get a printable copy right now, and the Kindle version is going to be released in early November. So by the time this podcast airs, because we're about four to five weeks ahead of time, it looks like that. It will be released. Yep. Yep. This is my copy. So, but yeah, there it is. I can't even believe it. I'm still pinching myself. Yes. 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 And Nidia, I'm going to pull up your website here also, because I want people to see these beautiful pictures of the San Antonio gorgeous. I just love this picture. And if this is outside your house, I want to come visit you. (laughs) Wait, you have a place here. We call it the Hacienda Derby. It's Spanish style and we've got a courtyard and things and yeah. So your website is called www.openhandinstitute.com. And I see that you have live classes right there at the Hacienda, but you also have online classes on your website. You have some beautiful videos that we could practice with you. Anything else you want to tell us about Open Hand Institute and or your new upcoming book? So the Open Hand Institute is my educational platform. I have Nidia's Yoga Therapy Studio. I have three personalities now. Nidia's Yoga Therapy Studio is my yoga studio. The Open Hand Institute, this will sound the way it's going to sound, but I always said that Nidia's Yoga Therapy Studio would never offer teacher training. Mm. There was a reason for that, that I felt strongly, and I'll share it with you. I had very strong thoughts, whether it's right or wrong, that many studios were offering yoga teacher training just to keep their studios open. Mm. And I felt strongly that that was not a good plan. We can't do that. We have to have a passion for that. So in 2015, I got an opportunity to actually start a teacher training. And I thought, well, if Nidia's Yoga Therapy is not going to ever do that, let's start the Open Hand Institute and let's do a platform, an educational platform that is focusing on providing, educating, elevating, not just yoga teachers potential 200 or 300 hour, but actually elevating and educating physical therapists, clinicians who might need continuing education. And so, you know, Open Hand Institute exists now. Open Hand Institute is it's responsible for my community outreach, the book, all of that, and we'll continue to expand the platform 
because I'm getting ready right now. I've actually done some proposals to the independent school districts that I grew up in Rio Grande Valley, which is an area that needs a lot of help. <laughs> I grew up in the further South Texas. And so I'm applying to try to offer them programs for their educators. And I want to teach therapeutic yoga to the teachers and the teaching staff and the people who now will then be able to teach their students because I want the staff to learn how to downregulate. So I'm not trying to go teach yoga teachers at the school level. I want to teach them these skills because I feel that it would be very important to then that trickles down to the students when the teacher can embody a practice that helps them downregulate. So I felt very strongly about that. And I'm actually applied to my own alma mater, my high school, my independent school district that I went to school with. So let's see. I hope that they I've done a few presentations for them and their central office and I'm well-received and I'm grateful and I'm looking forward to, you know, connecting and going to the source to, to the schools. Is it full circle? I mean, you were a young woman in that school system, probably didn't know how to regulate yourself at that time. Oh, the stories (laughs) (laughs) completely. I love that. I love that. And I love that you're wanting to teach the teachers who can just use it in the classroom right here, right now. We don't have to go to a special yoga mat. We don't have to take an hour out of our day. Like the teachers in the school can say, all right, everybody, we're going to take a three minute breathing break, you know? Exactly. (laughs) Thank you, Nydia, for being with us today. We wish you so well with the launch of your new book. I'm so grateful for you. Therapeutic Yoga Works. And I'm grateful for you. I see you on social media. I smile every time I see you. And I love knowing that there's good people in the world out there doing amazing work. You know, just trying, right? My mom, Bobby, she's going to be 87 years old and she takes my class live stream five days a week. My gosh. (laughs) And I learned from her that you know, and she always said, God will never hear you if you don't speak up. So in the course of my lifetime, I've always just tried, you Mm -hmm. know, let me just try. I've got to try. I got to ask and let me just try. And if I fail, my parents also taught us, you'll be okay. Yeah. They said, no. Okay. You get to keep going. It's all right. It's not your life. It's just a no. Yeah. No for today. Yeah. For today. Exactly. (laughs) You're really fortunate that way. I think. You know, we're looking forward, we're getting ready to throw her a birthday party next year. So I'm really grateful for her insight. And she was ahead of her time as a Hispanic woman born in 1937. So, yeah. And now you get to be a mother figure to so many others through your work. Thank you. Thank you for what you do and for this podcast. It's amazing. Five years? Is it? It's only been two and a half, but we oh, already... Oh, it's, that's what it is. It's the, it's the episodes. Yeah, we've gotten to 100,000 downloads in two and a half years. I'm just blown away. So I'm living my life purpose here and I enjoy every single episode. Do it so well. I mean, I just listened and listened and listened. I was in my garden over the summer, just listening and listening and enjoying and so many wonderful people that you had on. I just thought, wow. You are definitely in your place because this is amazing what you're doing with us. Thank you. Thank you, Nydia, for coming and talking with us today. After Nydia and I finished the interview, we turned the recording off and we really shouldn't have. I wish you could have all heard the conversation. But what it boils down to is that community matters. When we come together, and it really honestly doesn't matter if it's online in a Zoom room or if it's in person, being with other people on a weekly basis where you can check in, see the same faces, learn together, grow together, breathe together, be together. It actually is a healing tool all in of itself to have this bookmark in your week when you come together as a group and as individuals to do self-care. So Nydia has weekly classes online that she streams. I have a yoga therapy clinic every Monday night, and we have such a nice community. And I know Nydia does too, that comes together. We're all getting to know each other over time. I have a different theme every month for my classes. 
And we already have the 2024 calendar out if you're interested. And Nydia also has a beautiful community that comes together several times a week to practice online together. So I just want to encourage you that if you're having any kind of low back pain or neck pain, or if you just want a place to go every week where you can feel cared about and connected and loved up by some mama bears like Nydia and myself, we invite you to our classes, especially online, even if you're around the world and make yourself a priority. Give yourself that time to regulate your autonomic nervous system, to stretch your body, to breathe, to feel, and to connect. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Yoga Therapy Hour and Beyond. We love to give you the gift of this podcast each week, and we'd love your support. You can support us through becoming a Patreon member. You can download the Optimal State mobile app and join as a member of the mobile app community. You can give us a great rating on the platform that you listen to this podcast on and many other things that would help us. Contact us if you'd like to be of support. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to our continued relationship with you. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.